Kadisha is our director of multi-location solutions, and I'm so excited for her to dig into this topic. Kadisha, I'm going to hand it over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this summit uh, to talk about women in business. Hopefully, you've been with us all day, or if you are just tuning in, we're so happy to have you here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about how to unleash great brand experiences with our panel of guests today. Um, so they're eager to share their knowledge, their experience, um, tell you all about how they do it. Uh, before we get started, feel free to comment, ask questions, share love via emoji in the chat. Um, and I will try to address any questions as uh, we end the near of this panel. Um, but want to jump in by introducing our guests. Uh, and maybe ask them a little warm up question about what brand is on heavy rotation in their household. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Sarah Gustad. Uh, Sarah is the executive vice president of marketing at Talking Rain Beverage Company. This is a beverage powerhouse. If you don't have sparkling ice, go out and get sparkling ice. They are a best selling sparkling water brand. Uh, Sarah has led the brand's transformation from traditional marketing tactics to digital, with an emphasis on targeted advertising on social media and the web. Under Sarah's leadership, the Sparkling Ice brand has experienced record-breaking growth and remains the number one sparkling water brand in America. Um, we're super excited to have Sarah with us today. She's also an Ironman triathlete. Those are my dreams, girl. I don't know how you do it. Uh, and she enjoys playing rec recreational soccer and traveling the world with her husband. Uh, so thank you for joining us today, Sarah. Sarah. Hi. It looks like you have a busy household. What, what brand is on heavy rotation in your household? Uh, well, because I'm active, I do, uh, of course, wear a lot of uh, Brooks running shoes. Anybody who isn't familiar with them, uh, they're a local-based company as well, and actually number one in their field. Uh, if you look at my shoe rack, you probably see two, three, four, five pair on any given point uh, that I wear out pretty quickly uh, as, as, as I'm kind of running around uh, the Seattle area. Um, also, uh, another big brand for me, of course, Sparkling Ice. Uh, you know, it's in my daily rotation, whether it's a caffeinated experience with our plus caffeine. Uh, we also have our non-caffeinated version, and then it makes a really great mixer. So on the nights of weekends with friends, I, of course, am making my sparkling ice cocktail. Oh, I love that, Sarah. I'm like a faithful New Balance girl when it comes ah, to running okay. shoes, but my spouse is on the Brooks train with you. And so we are divided <laughs> in sneakers. But now, divided. Okay. Yeah. now I'm tripping over pairs of, of Brooks by the doorway. So, so great to hear that. Uh, the next panelist I want to introduce to you is Jody Packin. Uh, Jody is the Senior Vice President of Brand and Marketing Communications at The Skim. If you haven't read The Skim, get The Skim in your life. Um, the Skim is a di digital media company giving millennial women, and I would really say all women, uh, the information they need to live their smartest lives. Jody works to elevate and grow The Skim's brand, um, which is one of its strongest assets. And the Skim is a trusted source for its community of more than 12 million users across its platforms. Uh, Jody is a mission-driven leader with years of success in creating and leading and executing on campaigns that deliver lasting brand value. And Jody is an award winner in the space. So Jody, we're super happy to have you on board. We'd love to hear what brands are in heavy rotation in your household. Yes. Um, other than the Skim, of course, starting your day with your Daily Scam newsletter to get you up to speed on all things very quickly, um, in addition to our Scam Your Life and Skim Money emails. Um, I also have two small kids at home, so a lot of the brands that are in heavy rotation with us right now, um, I'm going to throw in a different shoe brand because my kids are huge fans of Nike sneakers, more on the fashion sneaker front. Um, Roblox is a big one in our house, and really just... Um, Amazon music is huge. Like we love to have big, this dance break before we started. Amazing. Uh, we love to have dance parties as a family and lots of games that we can play together. I would say those were, were more brand agnostic on the game front. Um, but anything that 
despite me calling out Roblox earlier, gets us all on off screens um, and moving together is, is helping and music has a fun way of doing that. So. I love that. Amazing. Great. Our next Thanks guest is me. Nanette Wassa. And Nanette is the founder of Chrome Cycle Studio, the first and only boutique spin studio in Westwood in Los Angeles. Uh, she opened Chrome Cycle in April of 2017 after a long road of creating, planning, and building, and a really big decision to leave her career as a practicing trial attorney. Nanette's passion for indoor cycling and later anything fitness really helped her shift from being um, from fitness being a passive background activity to really becoming her life's purpose and mission. Um, so without looking back, the net worked to develop a brand and environment that not only she believed in, but her team of instructors, employees, and customers would feel equally motivated to support and promote. So Nanette, you have built from the ground up. I love it. Yes, uh, what you. brands are in heavy rotation for you? Okay. So along the shoe line, I actually, the heaviest rotation for me is TM Athletic. They are a um, spe specifically cycling created cycling, um, you know, shoes that you could wear functionally as well. Um, they're very cute shoes. Woman founded, mm -hmm. um, started, I would say about seven, eight years ago. And I kind of saw their progress along with Chrome Cycles progress and growth. And um, it's a really great shoe line. They also have a studio shoe that is does not have the cycling cleat. So check out TM Athletic. It's T-I-E-M. Um, newly in my rotation of brands is the Skim, which I had never been introduced to before. Yes, before this panel. And Jody, I have been catching up on the Skim over the last like week or so. And I'm, you know, super excited that it was introduced to me. So thank you for that. So those are my two brands. Um, I love expert branders because like branding for each other, doing the branding panel. It's very meta. I love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, our final guest is Katie Patochny. Katie is the executive director and head of Wink, MailChimp's global in-house creative agency. Uh, since 2018, Katie has grown Wink into an award-winning collective of 40 plus fearlessly talented creatives across design, advertising, and studio production. Uh, prior to MailChimp, Katie led brand design at Etsy, spearheading its first app-focused brand identity, sounds really cool, and building the company's first ever TV advertising campaign. Uh, Katie has a background in advertising art direction. She's an alumna and former instructor at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And Katie lives in Atlanta with her husband, her two daughters, and shrimp, the dog who acts like a cat. You might have to return them. I don't know, Katie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to hear what, what brands are in heavy rotation in your household. I love this question. It really makes you reflect. Um, I have I, I got to chime in with my shoe brand. Unfortunately, it's not very athletic. It's Birkenstocks. <laughs> like um, just all kinds of Birkenstocks and ultimate comfort. Um, I uh, well, thank you for that introduction. You mentioned my two daughters. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, big, so I'm big into Instacart um, to just constantly be buying milk and bananas. Um, and then I think uh, maybe not in constant rotation anymore, but um, you know, having had my second daughter a year ago, Frida Mom, Frida Baby, Frida Mom is a brand that I just like, I love and feel connected to for life because I felt um, so seen by the business, not only like doing the the snot sucker kind of gross, but if you're a parent, you get it. Uh, the the Frida baby, like all that gross stuff that you need to just sort of get by as a parent, but also the way they expanded their product offering for um, you know mothers postpartum, and they did it in such a like hilarious, irreverent way. And their advertising is so honest and transparent, and talking about you know the 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 parents' experiences, especially the woman's experience. Um, and I, I just, it meant a lot to me and it, what they wasn't around for my first daughter. So, um, I still have all their gear around, even though I don't really need it anymore. I just feel real kinship with that brand and appreciate what they do. So wanted to mention it. <laughs> that is a serious shout out that Frida knows device. It kind of gives me nightmares when I think back on it, but it was, <laughs> you can't it's misuse it. You can't misuse it or you're in trouble. 
but but thank you for for sharing such such a great brand. Um, so brands, branding. I mean, these are terms that are thrown around all the time, right? People are like, I gotta I gotta build a great brand. Um, but a brand experience feels a little bit different. And I would love to have you all speak to exactly what is a brand uh, experience. And I'll, I'll kick it off, Tony. Yeah. Um, so I always center on your brand is what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. Your last touch point, your last experience, Katie, you described Frida so perfectly. And most of it was not around when my kids were little, but I'm sitting there nodding because that's not sucker. And that experience is, is so deeply ingrained in my brain. But that brand love that you get from that utility and trust that you've built, that's your last touch point with them. So that's what the brand is to you. So, you know, when you're creating a really powerful brand experience, I think there are a multitude of ways to do that across digital platforms, across IRL experiences, across the product itself, across the content that you build around it. But really core to it is how is your brand delivering on your mission and your value prop? For us at The Skim, our mission is to empower generations of informed, confident women. So how do we do that? We do that through our content. We do that through our experiences. Most recently, last week, we launched an initiative called State of Women um, that was grounded in a study that we did with a Harris poll, which, you know, we talked to a lot of women today who, no surprise to any of us, are saying, hi, the state of women is not working. Now we have the data to back it up. And what can we do about it? And so the response just to this white paper, this study, this survey, this experience of feeling seen and represented by a brand um, created a really powerful experience for our end user. And it's not just to say, hey, read the Daily Skim in the morning. Hey, read our up and coming new parenting newsletter. Hey, read our you know information on well or follow us on Instagram. Anyone can say that, but giving our consumers that experience of feeling seen and heard and represented by us as a brand, I think makes for a really powerful brand experience that builds that trust and has them coming back. And if you then ask them, who are, who's the skim? What do they do? Um, we hope they'll be able to tell you, well, they're representing me, giving me the info I need to make confident decisions because they've teed me up. Um, and then I can go from there. I love that, Jody. I absolutely love that. Um, I would love to hear anyone else, um, you know, when you think about, you know, I imagine some folks are sitting on the audience and says, I have a good brand, but how do I, how, how does it become a brand experience? Um, we'd love to hear maybe Katie, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think like when you, when you think about your business and your brand and how, how do you actually bring it to life? I think you can kind of step back and really ask yourself, how can I tap into the story of my brand, the purpose of it, um, and, and define it, say it out loud, write it down, and then really think about your customers and how you could leverage emotions to help them connect to your story. And you have lots of components to consider and all the different touch points of your, of your business, whether it's your space, your product, your website, your email connections, you know, MailChimp, we think a lot about about emails and um, you know as a marketing platform, um, and and then all the stakeholders and your you know that you want to speak to your audiences, and your brand identity. So you know um, I think your tone of voice is super important. Your visual style, um, your brand behaviors and values that I think come to life through your story. You have all the ingredients. Um, it's sometimes just a bit of a thought exercise to sit down and reflect on your journey and what makes your business unique. And oftentimes, depending on your industry, your brand experience is really what differentiates you, you know, um, and uh, it's something that's differentiated MailChimp from, from the beginning in terms of being, you know, an email marketing platform. We show up in a way that's really authentic to our, uh, you know, founder's story, um, who, you know, designers and um, very close to the Atlanta community and really believing in the creativity of, small businesses, mid-market businesses, and um, and and the difference they can make in the world. So we always try to demonstrate that through everything we do. And that's what defines our brand experiences. How can we inspire our customers in a way that they uh, feel creative and brave to be themselves for their customers? And because um, if we're not demonstrating that as like a MailChimp, like the marketing platform, then then we're not we're not demonstrating the power of our own product, right? It's a little bit meta. Um, <laughs> uh, 
but uh, yeah, I think uh, as the as a creative leader, last thing I'll say, my team, you know, um, Wink Creative. We um, we really try to bring together our tone of voice. So like how we write, how we show up, you know, in 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 copy, um, with the tone of our visuals. What are our hero colors? Um, you know, of course you have your logo and and your typefaces and stuff, but it's really about the composition of it all and how you bring it to life in in all of those touch points. So there's it's so much fun to play with, and you just have to kind of like set out all your ingredients, reflect on who you are and have fun with combining them in different ways, um, you know, for your audiences, of course, in a way that brings the business results that you're looking for. So, yeah. I really love what you just said. You know, the way that, the way that we kind of approach it is, is very similar. Um, at the end of the day, like we're always founded in, in our brand purpose, right? And we're very intentional on how that gets expressed across the various touch points. Um, but we have a saying like, we're not same luggage, you know, I'm, I'm Sarah Gustat, but how I talk to my 10 year old niece versus my husband versus my CEO is different, but I'm still authentically myself across those touch points. And a brand is much the same way. And you have to be very intentional and thoughtful on that. So just to kind of back up what, what we're hearing right now, I, I just, I completely agree with you. Authenticity is such a great word to keep in mind. You know, sometimes you might you know, you're, you look at your competitors or, you know, you have certain pressures and it's easy to feel like you have to kind of behave like another business or compare yourself. But I think that at MailChimp, our gut check has always been what's authentic to who we are and what feels right. Sometimes it's pretty intangible and, and it's hard to actually scale to others. I mean, that's the kind of importance of like brand guidelines and, you know, experiences for your own employees to maybe help them really, even new ones, especially understand the, your brand viscerally. I think brand experience is really important internally too, when it comes to culture, of course, but, but yeah, that authenticity, like that's such a great word to just kind of like have, have in front of you all the time to, as like that, that reminder. I love that, Sarah. Yeah, no, I'd love to, oh, oh, so ahead, sorry. Ah, no, I'd love to expand on that as well. And um, growing that th this um, these definitions are really resonating with me and to expand on, you know, your brand being what people say about you when you're not in the room or that authenticity that you bring, you know, for me, at Chrome Cycle, we're a fitness studio in Los Angeles, uh, hundreds, right? There's hundreds of us. Um, what makes us stand out or what makes, you know, people, our customers and our community keep coming back to Chrome Cycle is that feeling that they get when they walk out the door or walk in the door or when they think about your brand. So getting on an indoor cycle um, in any studio or even in your living room, if you have that convenience, um, you can do that, you know, anywhere, but to do it, to keep coming back to the same place, it's because we're creating that brand experience that leaves them with that feeling that, wow, I, I, feel good here. I feel safe here. I fit in here. I want to, you know, I want to do it again. I want to feel that again. And we, you know, really work really hard to impart that experience so that people do feel that sense of inclusion in any brand, whether it's a brick and mortar or a, an actual product, people want to feel seen, included, heard, um, and like they are getting the value for their contribution to your business. So it's for us, we look at it as like more of a partnership with our people than, you know, even our customers. Yes, we're asking you to spend money and we're asking you to invest in us, but we're also investing in you. We're investing in your fitness journey and your routine, and we want to be here for your wellness. Um, so I think that really kind of captures all of the authenticity and that brand feeling. I, I, one of the things I, I think about, especially with um, each of your backgrounds, is you got to cut across a lot of noise, right? Like I imagine, you know, trying to hit people's inbox, <laughs> you know, Jody and Katie, um, and really stand out and keep that level of authenticity. Uh, you know, Sarah, like the beverage industry is huge. There's so much competition there. Uh, in the net, like in your space, I mean, there's a, there's might be a couple big competitors, right? When we think about <laughs> cycling out there. Um, so the ability to do that um, is great. And I would love to hear from you all, kind of really specifically in thinking about something you've done that created a great brand experience. Like what's an example of how you really like took this on and, and built it out and created that 
experience for your consumers. And I'll um, I'll start with you, Nanette, just to, to speak to how you actually shape that up for um, for folks who are coming into the studio. Sure, thanks. Um, one of our one of the things I'm the most proud of is that we are constantly looking for ways to really give back to our community. So, for example, we do. I would say, uh, you know we're getting back to it now. Obviously pandemic was a little rough, um, but pre-pandemic we had built up to, we were doing, you know, a really big charity event at least once a month um, for, you know, all kinds of um, various organizations, small and large, that were important to our community and important to our people. Um, one of our instructors uh, has lupus. We did a lupus charity ride almost monthly where she would donate um, she would donate her earnings and we would donate as a studio and we would really advertise for the lupus community. I learned so much about um, the ailments of lupus and and how you know we can help uh, just just from connecting with someone in my community. Um, we've done things you know with like I said, large and small organizations and having, uh, our community learn about these organizations also just like keeps our community tight. So um, this weekend we're having a actually a charity fundraiser for a group called Camp Kesem at UCLA. Uh, Kesem is a student run uh, charitable event. What they uh, what they do is they provide camps for children whose parents are undergoing cancer treatment. Uh, it's you know these kids are in a rough space and this program. Um, countrywide, they are student run at all different universities, and they they provide camp counselors and a safe space for these kids. I never would have known about it if it weren't for two of my employees, you know, front desk uh, at Chrome Cycle, UCLA students who brought their mission and their cause to us, and we really try to expand that and extrapolate and and you know, blast out to our people. By the way through our MailChimp uh, emails. <laughs> we do reach our um, reach our community and make sure that we're doing our best to not only, you know, take from the community, but really give back to our community as well. Yeah, I think um, a couple of the things you just hit on really resonate. One is you're meeting your, your community and your audience where they are. And that's such a core principle for us of, of what we endeavor to do, whether it's the platform or the issue that matters to them most. And the, the other two are just building that trust and loyalty together. And so you are taking an example where you've heard them really intently and intentionally and said, okay, this is what you need. And here's what I can provide. Um, we do that very frequently with our audience, with our skimmers is what we call our audience of 12 million, uh, mostly millennial women across all platforms. Um, and some great examples of that recently have been around the issue of paid family leave, which, you know, is not nationally supported. And we knew it wasn't going to get passed in the bill. And in a moment of frustration, one of our co-CEOs posted and said, oh, I can't like, I can't do this, but what can we do? And so uh, an initiative that we built called Show Us Your Leave was born. There were, there are now more than 600 different companies that have shared their paid family leave program in the corporate sector. And we've had so many skimmers come to us saying, these tools are so valuable. I've been able to get my policy changed. I've been able to see where I can look for a job next if I want to have a family or I'm caring for an ill family member because that's what they needed. That's what they were missing. And they told us and shared it with us related to the content that we were putting out in the world. And we built this database um, and created this movement and this conversation all in response to what they needed from us at the moment. We knew in that moment in time, we weren't going to be able to change national policy, but it flips that script and puts the power back in the hands of your audience and your community and your platform to say, okay, but what can I do? How can I make a difference? Prior to coming to the scam, I worked um, in nonprofit for a good chunk of time. And that, that ability to shift the power dynamic and put it in the hands of your community, whether it's taking a, a ride for a good cause or being able to share, you know, what you're able to do to change policy at your own company is really, really powerful. Um, and being able to continue that dialogue and then raise up and highlight great work that, that women and men and readers are doing, um, we've seen be really powerful for us, both with Show Us Your Leave, our election initiatives, and even every day in our morning newsletter, The Daily Skim, we have a section at the bottom where we're just shouting out fantastic community, community driven efforts um, from our audience too. And, and the response to that and the inspiration that others are getting from that, um, we've seen to continue to be so powerful. 
That's great yeah. to hear. Oh, thinking about thinking about um, kind of corporate social responsibility, and you know, I was kind of leaning in that direction as well. But just to kind of provide maybe a different example, um, that's um, you know something that I'm proud of for for Sparkling Ice is. Uh, we have really passionate consumers who are constantly reaching out to us, just sharing stories, whether it's their weight loss journey or recipes that they're creating with their kids and their family members or, you know, cocktails with their girlfriends. And they were approaching our sales team and our stores. They were approaching us on online or via social channels. And uh, we, we really wanted to kind of harness and celebrate those stories. So we created this idea, um, which is now turned into our rewards platform where we are inviting and celebrating with our fans um, the stories and the experiences they're creating with our brand. Um, we're not telling them who we are, what we are, it's how they are bringing it into their homes or into their lives. And we're just there to celebrate it with them. And that has kind of created this rewards platform where it's not this self-serving, tell us your story so we can show it on social media. And we might do that, um, but it's tell us your story. We wanna celebrate there with you. And we want to continue on that journey with you um, as Sparkling Ice kind of is just by your side, um, which I, I think is kind of turning into this really powerful relationship with our consumer uh, that in previous years we just really hadn't had. So that was just one example I wanted to share. I love that. I love how it turned into your loyalty program. That's so cool. It's like sometimes it's just about observing observing mm -hmm. your audience, right? What are you noticing? What insights can you glean from the the way that they show up, you know, what, when they're, when they're, you know, at your, at your service or offering or like, you know, the feedback they give you and you can get so many ideas from that. Um, and I, uh, I guess the, the example that comes to mind for, for MailChimp in terms of a brand experience, um, uh, this past year, we had um, a big paid campaign, uh, Guess Less, Sell More. It was a big TV campaign. Some of you might have seen it, like, especially during like NFL. And it was really about how MailChimp helps marketers take the guesswork out of out of marketing. And, you know, um, whether it's automations to help you, um, you know, save time or stop kind of trying to guess what your different customers want, how can you segment and automate so that you can really spend more time being creative. So that whole campaign was going on over here. But like um, we, we think about ways to extend on that campaign and create further brand activations and, and experiences. And um, another thing that we did was um, in line with one of our brand behaviors, which is around the democratization of access. So what does that mean? Well, in the same way that the paid campaign, which is an ad campaign, very overtly, we take the guesswork out in the mystery out of some of the hardest parts of being a marketer. We also wanted to, you know, demystifying, but also democratize access to stages and places where small businesses and, and their marketers might not have access to. So what we did was um, we showed up at New York Fashion Week. Okay, why is MailChimp at New York Fashion Week? But it was um, this idea we had to, you know, on this big stage for US designers, um, you know, that are very fancy, like luxury designers, but so noisy and busy, like how would you break through as a small fashion brand? So we're thinking about small businesses, what about fashion brands? You see New York Fashion Week, how could, how could you, how do you even start to break through there? Well, we partnered, we, we like, we loved showing up there because it's unexpected for MailChimp, but like, how can we give access to a small business on this amazing stage using, you know, the, the ability that MailChimp has as a large, you know, business. So we partnered with IMG and the Black and Fashion Council to take the guesswork out of building a fashion business by giving five emerging Black designers access to New York Fashion Week. Um, and so um, they showed up in a capsule, there was capsule collections, these five designers uh, created designs and all five of the designers work sold out and um, they were you know in this pop-up within New York Fashion Week so they sold out and it was a really huge success and um, that was a brand experience that was you know a, a creative like metaphor but had a huge impact on these um, these uh, designers it created a great brand halo for MailChimp and it, it it connected into the campaign we had going and and that's what we kind of strive to do it's like 
when you do good, you, you, you try to do good at all, all, at all times and do right by your customers. You're also needing to meet your business goals. And you also want to build your, build up your brand image and identity. And I love what y'all are saying about loyalty and trust and feeling seen. Like there's so many creative decisions you can make to, to come across in a certain way and build that brand affinity. So like, why would MailChimp be at New York Fashion Week? Well, there's that thinking behind it that got us there. And um, of now people are like, well, sure, that's that makes sense that MailChimp would show up there because they're a creative brand and they think in an offbeat way uh, to connect to small small and mid-sized businesses and their marketers. You know what I mean? So I, um, I love, I'm hearing all of y'all's ideas of just like you start with a kernel of an insight and you build, build, build. Um, and it can turn into something really unique and magical and differentiated. And that's what's a really important piece of criteria for a really good brand experience. And okay. also really rewarding to come back to, to, we get rewarded with that, that loyalty, right? We get rewarded with the customers sharing their stories. And sometimes you touch people that you have no idea you're touching, um, or that, you know, you you're just going about your daily business and, you know, operating my cycling classes. And we actually had, I'll tell it just a quick story about a customer who's still, uh, he came in about, I would say a year, a little over a year ago, he booked three different classes, like his intro class. And he kept buying classes before he ever made it in the door. And I had seen, I was like, God, do I email this guy? It's weird. He like never shows up when he finally came in he um, was very nervous, very shy, timid, just was didn't even want to walk through the door. And we were just our usual, you know, fun, weird selves and be like, come on in, we got you. Let's get you, you know, get you going. And he said that because due to his his size, he's he was, you know, really overweight. He's lost 80 pounds since cycling with us. Um, and, you know, obviously being on a, a wellness journey himself that he was so intimidated and scared to walk in the door of like a brick and mortar, but anything he was trying to do on his own wasn't working and he needed the routine. And he really was so scared to come in. And when he felt us welcome him like that, it was so disarming of all of his, you know, all of his preconceived notions of what it would be like to walk into an LA spin studio or just, you know, they just dropped. And he shared his story. It, it actually made me cry. And it took him a really long time to share, you know, that depth that we reached. And he's he's a customer for life. And it wasn't, again, it's about that feeling of safety. It wasn't about taking the spin class. You know, he actually, I don't even think he stayed for the whole first class. I mean, it was, you know, he, he didn't enjoy his first class. But being a part of that community and seeing that people were cheering him on and being like, you can do this, um, keep, you know, made him come back. I love all these stories. I mean, it really goes to show there's so many different kinds of experiences um, that you're able to, to, to create and it's a level of creativity. Um, you know, I love what you said, Katie, about kind of taking that nugget, that, that spark of insight and really growing uh, the brand and the experience from that. Um, I know we probably have a lot of small business owners in our audience. And if there's one thing I know about small business owners is they're usually stretched pretty thin. And so this idea of marketing and branding and creating these experiences can, can sometimes feel overwhelming. Uh, any advice you, you can give as far as how they can prioritize uh, creating a great brand experience? And I'll kick that over, let's say to Sarah. Yeah, I, I think it, it goes back to what we've been talking about today. Don't, don't try to solve all the problems at once right? Be founded and, and kind of create that, that brand purpose, right? What is your re reason for being? And allow that to kind of start helping you tell your story um, and, and where you tell your story. Uh, you need to know who you're going after, like who's kind of your, your core consumer, um, but also with the understanding that you need to authentically go where they are. Don't expect them to come to you, especially as you're, as you're building out your brand, um, but understand them, uh, you know, go to your focus groups, do some surveys uh, and really understand and have them tell you where you have permission to play, which is a little bit interesting to think about, but it's going to immediately unlock, I think the biggest opportunities and those the biggest rocks 
that you can go after. And then from there, start thinking about what are your medium sized rocks? What are your small rocks? What are those little sand pebbles? Um, but don't try to boil the ocean. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that. Um, I think everything you said is right, but the insights to that you developed and honed in on to develop your product, your business idea, your store, your food source, your bakery, that's what people are coming to you for. So how do you use your own voice um, to tell that story authentically? If you know, you're know you a store on the corner and you can't afford marketing just yet, free samples are a great way to start. There's also you know lean into what you know know what you know and know what you don't know. You don't have to be an incredible marketer to start to get the word out with your friends and family and your community. Even the way that the skim was started, our co-founders and co-CEOs tapped into their network. They used to work at NBC. They tapped into their network um, and started asking people to forward it along to other people. And I think getting over that hump of like, oh gosh, everyone's really busy. Like, I don't want to make people do things for me. I don't want to ask my family and friends. Nine times out of 10, they're going to be thrilled to support you. Um, cheering you on and wanting you to succeed. There's also the point, as I said, know what you know, know what you don't know. There are a lot of small boutique agencies and support and freelancers that can help you get the word out too. I know at the skim where um, we've just launched SKM lab, which is our agency side of our house and our business um, that can help, but there's a ton of other operations of any size. Katie's got one too, um, that can really support a, a multitude of different businesses and you don't have to do it all at once, as Sarah said, either. So start small, stick with what you know, build up that confidence and, and ask your friends and family to support you on that journey. And don't be afraid to reach out to other um, other small businesses. Don't be afraid to partner. Right. I wish I, I started that much earlier than I did. You don't have to be fully developed and have your identity you know, complete before you try to partner up with other like-minded small business owners to help collab and, you know, get the word out together about both your businesses, all your businesses. There's nothing better than collaborating with other um, business owners where you're kind of in the trenches together. I love that. There is something really powerful about asking for help. People really do want to help you. As an example, I had a, a high schooler reach out to me via LinkedIn, preparing for her college application and she simply just said hey i'm going to i'm trying to go to uw you went to uw i'd like to run some things by you as i look to aspire to be a marketer how do you say no to that right <laughs> you don't right so just ask for help yeah i i love that um we have just a, a few minutes left and i would love to find out from each of you as, as we talk about advice um and, and things people can do no matter what size their business is. Um, asking for help, and I put learning from mistakes. Um, I think it's just a huge way to learn from your own and learn from others. I would love to hear maybe starting with you, Katie, what's something that you know now that you wish you had known way back when, when you were building a new brand experience or, or, or out on this journey um, to get to where you are today? Oh, man. Um... And I would say like, 30 seconds if you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think for me coming at it from having been like an art student, you know, I'm just like, I just want to make cool stuff. And, you know, um, I I uh, didn't understand the power of of insights. Like I I, I mentioned, like understanding your customer and um connecting that with your imagination. And I think you can, even if you don't consider yourself creative, you are. And you, you're also just the fact that you maybe started a business or you're part of a new business, like that is inherently insanely creative. So it's in you to tap into that part of yourself. And I, I think bringing that sort of like performance and creativity together, the, the both sides of your brain, um, that's, that's um, a really powerful thing. And, and I learned that personally on my own journey too. Love it. Sarah, what about for you? Um, probably be humble. Uh, you know, our brands are given permission to be here and it's not by the consumer and it's not the other way around, you know, so like looking back as I think about um, the evolution that is sparkling ice, we, we took a really humble approach and that has allowed us to stay connected to our consumer and, and evolve. 
right? Sparkling Ice is a different brand than it was 10 years ago, five years ago. And that's because we've remained connected and we've continued that, um, that dialogue with our, with our consumers. We're not here telling people who we are. We're, we're having that conversation. Right. I think stay humble goes for everything. Uh, Jody, uh, any nugget for the audience? Yeah, I, I touched on it a little bit, but the, the best piece of advice that I was given um, by one of my closest friends uh, was when I was going from the agency side to nonprofit. And I, I looked at her and I was like, I do not have a civics degree. Like I have not worked for NGOs. I've had nonprofit clients, but like, I can't do this. And she's like, you know what you know, and you know what you don't know. Like you're a badass marketer. You totally understand communications and how to tell a story. You can learn the other industry. You can learn the rest of it. And that is something that in so many conversations, I've either shared that with others or continue to remind myself that you don't have to know everything. That's the great part about having a team or having a network or a community of, you know, the women that are on these pan this panel together, those who are at the summit, lean on them and they can fill in the gaps where you don't have that strength. You don't need to be, you know, the utility player that knows how to do every single thing. Even if you're a one man, one woman business at the moment, you lean into your strengths and your superpowers and find others that can help balance that out for you. And that makes you a better team and a better performer. Exactly. I love that. And then take us home. I will. Okay. Just quickly to kind of wrap it all up. I actually do believe that marketing I wish I had marketed better when we were opening and it doesn't have to be, you know, paid ads or spending actual dollars. I will tell you grassroots the, it took me about a year to do it um, within the first year uh, that we were open. It was finally like, you know what, we're going to print out beautiful postcards you know, spend a few hundred dollars and literally, pay, you know, pound the pavement and hand out a flyer for a free class or just even get, you know, in your neighborhood, get the awareness out that your brand is there just because you open the doors. It's not like, oh, we're here. Everybody come in and, you know, enjoy our product. People don't know you're there. Even if you have a huge sign and all the bells and whistles inside, if you're a brick and mortar, get pound, pound the pavement and, and do whatever you can to get as much marketing out there through, you know, free tools, knock on doors, um, advertise with other local businesses, drop off flyers, invite other people to come in for, you know, a first sample or a free, you know, whatever consultation. And then, you know, the word will start to spread a little bit better and you'll get a little bit bigger. I love it. Pound the payment. Stay humble, know what you know, know what you don't know, and tap into your creativity. Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing all your insights on branding with the audience. Um, just, just great to hear how you see these things and how you help really build the companies that you're in. 